Heavenly Father, we, we, we thank you for the fact we can hear what I pray that people still trying to join us could join us. And I pray that you would help us to um, yeah, understand your word better. Um, help me. I feel a bit flustered like best by this morning. Help me to focus and concentrate as I preach. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if we're going to solve a problem, it's always important to get the right diagnosis to start with. So I guess we've been struggling with this technology problem. We, we, we thought we had the right diagnosis and we're still struggling. So maybe we haven't got the right diagnosis. You know, so the same with the, the coronavirus, I guess. The medics have been desperately trying to um, study the virus and try and work out, you know, how it works and uh, how it spreads uh, so they can write, come up with the right solution about producing a vaccine or working out how we can live with it. And of course, it's not just medical problems. You know, if you're driving a car and there's a noise in the engine, you think mm, that doesn't sound right. It's important to understand what the problem is. You just get Philippe in or some other person who knows about cars and uh, find out what is the problem is. And sometimes we can be a bit wary of doing that because we know the diagnosis may well be hard and painful. You're driving along, you hear this thing in the engine, you think, oh, that doesn't sound good. But sometimes you're quite tempted just to keep sort of driving along because you somehow hope it'll fix itself. But often that can be disastrous. The, the, the noise continues, and then you suddenly break down on the motorway. So if we're going to fix a, a problem, it's important that we get the right diagnosis so we can get the right solution. And today we're going to do something more ambitious than try and work out Zoom or try and work out the coronavirus or a car. We're going to try and work out what the problem with the world is. We're going to look at what the Bible says is the problem with our world today. What's wrong with the world? It's clear that something isn't right. We look around the world, sadly, we see wars, we see violence, we see all sorts of things going on. We, we grumble and complain even when there isn't war and violence. Even apparently people who have you know, all the wealth and success and fame are often unhappy. What is the problem? Well, people come up with some diagnosis. Maybe it's poverty you know if only we could um ha people could have more stuff or the stuff we've got we could distribute better uh would that make things better maybe it's the environment we're aware that the environment's not great maybe if we looked after the environment better that would be the answer sometimes people suggest maybe it's a lack of education you know if any people around the world could be better educated uh, then everything would be okay now i'm going to get education i'm going to against uh, looking after the environment or redistributing wealth. But I think we have to say the problem is deeper than that. Even well-educated people who, um, with lots of money, are often unsatisfied. Well, today in this series of Firm Foundations, we're going to look at the Bible. We're going to look at God's diagnosis for what is wrong with the world. And whether you would call yourself a Christian or you're just joining us um, to find out more about the Christian faith. I just want to say you're really welcome. If you're just trying to find out more about the Christian faith, you're really welcome. It's great that you can join us. We're going to think about what does the Bible say about the diagnosis? And really, um, if you can turn in your Bible, so you've got a Bible with you, back to the uh, first reading that uh, Grace read, I think we get the diagnosis and it's very simple. It's that we are rebellious tenants in God's world. We're rebellious ten tenants in God's world. I'm not actually going to put up my points on the screen today. Various people said that that seemed to distort um, the recording or distort the image last week. So I'm just, I did send out a handout, so I hope you printed it off. But my first point is that we are rebellious tenants in God's world. So Jesus tells the story of a man who plants a vineyard. Uh, Mark chapter 12 and verse 1. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall round it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watch tower. So Jesus tells the story of a man who plants a vineyard, and he's taken the trouble to create this vineyard, and he's cleared the ground, he's bought the vines, he's planted them. And it's clear he's made a nice vineyard as well. This is right at the bottom of the range. This is a, you know, good. He's, he's built, a, he's built a, a um, wall around it to protect it. He's put a pit there for the wine press. Uh, so they can make wine there. 
and he's built a watchtower. The man clearly represents God. Here's a picture of God, our good and generous creator. In the first couple of sermons in this series, we've been thinking about who is God and what is he like? And we've seen that he is the all-powerful, all-generous creator, like this man creating his vineyard. God has created the world. What a wonderful place it is. He's a generous God. He's a loving God who wants to share his love with creation. He's a God who gives us life and breath and everything. So Jesus here talks of this watchtower, the wall, the wine press. God's creation is something that is taking care and work. It's a loving thing that he has done. And then we read that he rents out the vineyard. Verse two, so verse one, he rented out the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. God rents out the vineyard to some tenants. I think here Jesus first is probably talking about Israel in the Old Testament, the idea that God gave them the land. We've been thinking about that in the book of Joshua in our Bible studies. So that's what Jesus is talking about primarily. But I think the parable can still be applied to humanity generally and the world generally. So God has created this fantastic and amazing world. It's super abundant. You know, he produces enough food every day to feed three and a half billion people. And he's created us. He's created humanity to rule the world and to care for it under his rule, to be his tenants if you like, as in a story. It's a glorious, generous act. What a great thing it is to be called to be a tenant, to be called to look after this creation for God. Our first kids question, what does God give to humanity? What does God give to people? But then something goes terribly wrong. Verse 2. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Here are the tenants rebelling. The man, he sends a servant to collect his due, to collect some of the produce of the land. It's the man's vineyard, after all. He's built it, he's planted, he's given all those fantastic extras. It still belongs to him. It's his. But the tenants don't see it that way. They decide the man has no right to his due. He has no right to demand any rent. In fact, he has no right to demand anything in the vineyard. Even though he created it, even though he provided abundantly for it. They just say no. The man tries again. Verse 4, then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treat him shamefully. He sent still another, that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. A sobering picture of the way that humanity treats God, of the way that Israel treated God in the Old Testament with the prophets, but how way we treat God generally. That is the problem with our world. God has given us a fantastic world. It's not a cheap model. It's one that's taken care and love and work. And we have reacted by being rebellious tenants. We ignore the fact that it's God who made us. We pretend that this world is ours to do with what we like. We pretend our own lives are ours to do with what we like. And sadly, that is the problem with the world. That's what the Bible calls sin. Shove off God. I'm in charge. No to your rules. And we can see that at its most sharp in how we treated Jesus. Verse 6. He said to, he had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. God sent his son into the world, the most glorious, the most brilliant, the most wonderful man who ever lived. As you read the Gospels, 
And it's just glorious what Jesus is like, his love, his compassion, his power to heal, his teaching. He's full of grace and compassion and goodness. And what do we do? We killed him. We rejected him. Second kid's question, what do the people do to Jesus? What do the people do to Jesus? Imagine uh, we go away on holiday and we, we have some friends who uh, are looking for a holiday. We say, well, well, you can borrow our house while we go away on holiday. And so we go away on holiday and our friends move into the house to, to enjoy it. We come back at the end of uh, two weeks away or whatever it is. We find that locks have been changed, that, that the key won't work anymore. We knock on the door and we sort of say, can we come in? But our friends either shout at us or, or sort of ignore us. Uh, we look through the window, we can see that some of our sort of best furniture has been trashed. Uh, we look at the pictures of our families on the wall and uh, they're, you know, they've been defaced or they've been changed. Maybe uh, we go away, we're confused. The next day we say, well, we'll send our, we'll send, we'll send our son to ask them. But he's dragged inside and beaten and killed. It's almost unimaginable, but that is how we treat God. And because this is such a serious problem, the Bible, understandably, tries to spend a lot of time analyzing what is going on. What is the right diagnosis of this problem? And that's why I ask Grace also to read uh, from Romans chapter 1 and 2. So let's turn to that in our Bibles. If you've got a church Bible, it's on page 11. Two nine, page 1129. So my first point is the problem is that we are rebellious tenants. My second point is that our rebellion begins in our hearts and minds. Our rebellion begins in our hearts and minds. Let me read from Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So what do people do? Well, they suppress the truth. And what is it, this truth, that they suppress? Well, let's read on in verse 19. Since what may be, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. What is the truth they suppress? Well, that we live in a world that has been created by a God who has eternal power and divine nature. You look around us, we should see that this world is made by a God who has eternal power and divine nature. Richard Dawkins, the atheist biologist and author of The God Delusion, acknowledges in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, that the world looks like it has been created. It gives the impression that it has been designed. But he says, you want to go with that impression. I'll explain why it's actually come about by chance. It looks like it's been created. It looks like it's been designed. The Bible says that's because it has been created. That's because it has been designed. And so there at the end of verse 20, so that people are without excuse. Some of us will say, well, well, what about those who've never heard about God? Well, the Bible answers that if we live in God's creation, we have heard something very important about God. We know that God has eternal power, that he has a divine nature and that he created everything. And so what do we do? Well, we're like the tenants. We just suppress the truth. We pretend that God is not there, that he's not real. We pretend that we can live our lives without him, just as the tenants did. We can tell him to shove off. And sadly, we can see that in our world today. And you see how there's been actually no mention of God, really, in our politics or our leaders throughout this coronavirus that I have noticed. Shove off God, I'm in charge. Let's look at verse 23. We've exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Rather than worshipping God, what do we worship? 
We worship ourselves or our created world. Verse 25. They exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. We end up worshipping the creation and ultimately we end up worshipping ourselves. We put ourselves in charge. Shut off God. I'm in charge. Third kid's question. Who do we think is in charge of our world? Who do we think is in charge of our world? And if we look at our lives, we can see that that is so true. How much time do we actually think, well, what does God want me to do in this situation? What would God like me to do? Compared to the amount of time when we just instinctively do what we want to do. We may spend a little bit of time reading the Bible. But on the whole, we just think, what is going to make me happy? What should I do? What's going to satisfy me? Shove off God, we say, I'm in charge. So rebellion that begins deep in our hearts, deep in our minds, but doesn't stop there. And this is my third point. So my first point, we're rebellious tenants. My second point, our rebellion begins in our hearts and minds. My third point is our rebellion affects everything. We haven't got time to look at verses 24 to 32, but they're very sobering to read. Paul begins in the sexual relationship arena verse 24 therefore god gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual immorality for the degrading of their bodies with one another god has made a glorious world he made male and female and he made sex to bring them together it's a glorious god-given gift it's pleasurable it's a wonderful thing just read the song of songs it's a wonderful thing it's part of God's good creation. He made it for a man and a woman to come together to enjoy in the context of a lifelong marriage to help them to live out that complex unity, to help them reflect the Trinity. As we were thinking about last week. And even in that, wonderfully, in that context of bringing the possibility of new physical life. We can celebrate my brother's my brother's daughters uh, had a daughter uh, in the last month or so. We've been celebrating the arrival of a new baby into our family. That's a wonderful privilege. What a great thing that is. But sadly, what do we do? We decide we know better than God about his gift of sex. And so there's pornography. There's adultery. There's prostitution. Affairs. One night stands. But Paul's clear, it's not just sex that's the problem. It affects every aspect of our lives. Look with me at verse 29. They became, they've become filled with every kind of wickedness, greed, evil, depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. God's not only given us a good creation, he's given us each other to, to live with. It gives good rules on how we can live together. But what do we do? We ignore these rules. Shove off God. I'm in charge. No to your rules. It's a rebellion that begins in the heart and mind, but a rebellion that ultimately affects every aspect of our lives. Uh, next kid's question. How much of our lives does sin affect? How much of our lives does sin affect? And our outward behavior is just a litmus test of our relationship with God. As we look at our behavior, it's full of these things that we describe, but they're just the symptoms, they're the outworkings, the outward signs, if you like. To get the diagnosis right, we need to see what is going in our hearts. Why have we said no to your rules? Because we've already said, shove off God in our hearts and minds. I'm going to be in charge. So we're rebellious tenants, our rebellion begins in our hearts and minds. Our rebellion affects um, everything. And next, our rebellion affects everyone. As we read through that catalogue of sin and uh, evil, sometimes it's easy for us to sort of stay off and go, yeah, the world is a terrible place. But in our minds, just half we think, yeah, but I'm not like that. I don't do those things. 
But let's read what Paul says in chapter 2 and verse 1. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. So he's looking at somebody who's pointing, going, yes, I can see the world. Yes, it's a terrible place. Paul says, you have no excuse. Because whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Why? Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Can you see what he's saying? He's saying when we point the finger, oh, yes, there's terrible, those envious people, those jealous people, all those um, gossips and slanderers. Yeah, they're terrible. Paul says, yeah, but you do the same things. I've been going to shop in supermarkets much more recently, and I just see it on a small scale. I'm greedy. I just think, well, that would be nice to have that. Oh, I'd like a bit of that. It's very easy to gossip. We hate it when people gossip about us, but it's very easy for us to gossip. Paul says, take an honest look at your life, at what you do. You, therefore, have no excuse because you do exactly the same things. We, too, have evil, greed, depravity. We too have murder, strife, deceit, malice. I'm sure you know, living in lockdown, you're living in close proximity with other people. We see strife. Why? Because we've said, shove off God. I'm in charge and I'm not going to obey your rules. We are rebellious tenants. All of us. All of us. Next kid's question, how many people have rebelled against God? How many people have rebelled against God? I just want to see just as we close, just read the depth of this problem. Come over to me. This is the final passage we'll be looking at in Romans 8. So it's over to page 1134, Romans chapter 8. And the point I want to make here is that rebellion me, our rebellion means that we can't please God. Our rebellion means that we can't <clears throat> please God. going to pick it up in uh, verse 6. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Sometimes when we look at this rebellion, we're tempted to think, well, I just need to be a bit better. I just need to cut out a few things. You know, I guess people are trying all sorts of things in the coronavirus lockdown. You know, some people are trying to get fit. Some people are trying to take up baking. You know, well, maybe I could say, well, I'm going to try and take, take up behaving a bit better. But the Bible's diagnosis says the problem is far, far deeper than that. We can't suddenly save ourselves with a little bit of rule keeping. We're dead, the Bible says. We're hostile to God. We can't submit to his law. We can't please him. By ourselves, we are completely and utterly lost. No, we have to look outside ourselves to the solution. We have to look outside ourselves in the wonderful plan of Jesus and his death and resurrection. But before we get there, and we'll get there in a couple of weeks, there is another important aspect of the diagnosis we will need to look at next week. And that is God's wrath, God's judgment as our rebellion. So we thought about those tenants and their attitude to God. We thought about the idea of somebody coming into our house and trashing it and not letting us in and pretending it's their house. Well, we'd be full of anger. We'd say, we want justice. Well, that's what we're going to need to look at next week. So at the moment, let's just reflect on what is wrong with the world. What is the diagnosis? It's not poverty. It's not education. It's not the environment. The problem is fundamentally is that we are rebellious tenants in God's world. It's a problem that starts in our hearts and minds as we suppress the truth about God. It's a rebellion that affects everyone and everything. And it's a problem ultimately that we can't solve. It's a problem we're going to have to find the solution in Jesus Christ. Well, I've left a, a question there for you to think about over lunch, about how does the diagnosis of the Bible compare with the diagnosis of the world?
But let's pray together now that God would help us to understand and cling to Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we've been learning in previous studies about what a great and generous and a loving God you are. Father, we thank you that you made this great world. In all your generosity, you give us life and breath and everything. We praise you for how you made us in your image to be your stewards and your tenants caring for your world. How you indeed gave us life and breath and everything. And yet, Father, we know that something's gone terribly wrong in our world. We can see the violence. We can see our wars. We can see hostility. And we know now the problem is that we are rebellious tenants in your world. That although you made this world and it belongs to you, we suppress that truth. We tell you to shove off. We worship ourselves. We pretend that we are in charge. And we see how that leads to a world of hatred and envy and jealousy, of strife and malice, fighting, murder, sexual morality. Heavenly Father, we confess all this. And we know that we often think, well, it's just somebody else's problem. We think that other people are far worse than we are. Father, we pray for a deeper conviction, a deeper realization that we are the source of the problem. That we're as much this terrible problem as anybody else. Help us see how our sin and rebellion affects every area of our lives. Help us see how offensive it is to you that we live in your world and yet we tell you to shove off and pretend that you're not there. Help us see that by ourselves we cannot please you, we cannot obey you. And Father, ultimately we praise you that in Christ there is a solution. When we understand the diagnosis right, there is a solution. In the Lord Jesus Christ, that in his death and resurrection, there is a way back. And Father, we pray for a deeper understanding of that great love that drove that solution, a deep appreciation of the depths of the problem and the wonder of your solution in Christ. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.